Sheffield, the most geographically diverse city in England, home to over half a million people who inhabit its seven hills. It's a place renowned for its industrial heritage, creative industries and independent trade. Some say it's the greenest city in Europe, with four trees for every person and an abundance of parks, gardens and woodland. A third of Sheffield lies within the Peak District National Park, which straddles its western border from north to south. Because of these features and its location on the earth, Sheffield is home to a unique form of weather. So I'm here on the western edge of Sheffield. Just over the hills in front of me to the east is the city and its suburbs. Behind me to the west lies the Peak District National Park, the southern end of the Pennines mountain range that runs from the Scottish border down to here. The Peak District stretches for about 30 kilometres from Manchester to here, and as it does, the land rises from about 35 metres above sea level to over 600 metres in the highest peaks. And as the land reaches Sheffield, the contours fade out into the valleys and the flatlands of the east. It's a day towards the end of July, the wind's blowing in from the west, bringing with it a mass of air from the Atlantic Ocean. In the air around Sheffield you can hear whispers of a myth, a shadow of rain cast over the city by the contours of the land. In the following minutes I'm going to take you with me on my journey around Sheffield and my chase for the truth behind its rain shadow. In the search for the answers to the questions, what exactly is a rain shadow? How does it work? Does it really exist? And if so, when's it going to happen next? But first, let's start by exploring where the idea first came from. Have you ever heard of Sheffield's rain shadow before? I've not, no. 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 Basically. Sheffield's rain shadow? No, I haven't. I'm aware of a rain shadow in Sheffield, yes. I've heard of the rain shadow, yeah. Not particularly relevant to she related to Sheffield, though. No. No, no. Oh, is that? Oh, well, unless it's the because the peak districts between here and Manchester and all the rain that falls on Manchester falls there because the peaks are in the way. I mean, it always feels like people talk about Sheffield as a rainy place. I don't but think it's I a rainy place. But I don't think it, yeah, I think it's got that reputation just by being up north. Oh, it's always rainier in Manchester. <laughs> <laughs> Definitely. Well known for it. Yeah, it's well known for it. About a couple of weeks ago, when I was up at Red Myers and it was apps, I got drowned. And in Sheffield, it wasn't raining that hard at all. We're in Dunworth, so the far west of Sheffield. Okay. So we're probably often just on that tail edge of the shadow anyway. So we, we experience the rain, and most of Sheffield doesn't seem to get it as much. <laughs> it turns out that the majority of people I spoke to hadn't heard about Sheffield's rain shadow. Although everyone had experienced the differences in weather between Sheffield and Manchester. I found out about Sheffield's rain shadow when I was living in Crooks and I kept noticing the recurring pattern of clouds moving over from the peaks into the valley of the city. So to try and establish how the idea became a part of common knowledge, I went into the local study section of the library to see what I could find. So I found Sheffield's rain shadow mentioned in a number of uh, records and local studies. There are two books that really stand out from all the rest that explore the phenomenon in detail. The first of these, which I believe is the first recording of Sheffield's Rain Shadow, was written in 1956 in an essay by Professor Alice Garnett from the University of Sheffield. She visualised the rainfall differences between Sheffield and the peaks in Manchester and sort of, I think, introduced the idea into, into the media. So the second book I found was written in 2011 by members of the Sorby Natural History Society and they sort of look at how Sheffield escapes some of the detrimental weather and a lot of the rainfall that comes over from the west because of its location to the east of the Pennines. An interesting thing I found in this book was they say the Peak District creates lee waves, which are waves in the atmosphere that can potentially influence the development of the rain shadow. Although these records confirm the existence of a rain shadow in Sheffield and maybe even the creation of its idea, they don't really explain how it works. And more than that, it's left me with a question. Where's the evidence for Sheffield's rain shadow? Rain shadows occur in locations across the earth. In the most extreme situations, they create some of the sharpest environmental gradients on the planet. What it really comes down to is an almost invisible interaction between the landscape and the atmosphere. And nowhere is this more evident 
than in the rainfall difference east and west of the Pennines. The inhabitants of Sheffield have been aware of the prevailing pattern of weather in the region for centuries. As the steel industry rapidly developed through the 19th century, the wealthy landowners looked to the hills of the west. Under a shadow of rain they erected townhouses and mansions, and in the east, where the pollution was carried by the prevailing winds, there was high density housing for the workers. Creating a city of steel came with a price, a divide, which is still evident in the city today, between the east and the west, and an equal distribution of health and wealth. But as well as its impacts on the city and its people, the land-air interaction leaves its most observable influence on the clouds. Whether it's relief from cloud cover or rainfall, or in the influence of the movement and creation of clouds. The chase for the rain shadow now turns to scientists who have dedicated their lives to understand the realm above our heads. Let's start at the beginning with the birth and death of a cloud. Without water in the atmosphere, the atmosphere uh, becomes a very miserable place uh, to, to exist in. So we've got this, this, this moist air at the surface and if it rises up through the atmosphere it, goes, it gets colder and colder. And in the same way that if you, if you breathe onto a cold mirror we get condensation. But you get exactly the same as uh, that process if you, if you take warm air at the surface and then lift it up through the atmosphere you'll get condensation happening. And that's the process that's happening in the atmosphere when we're producing clouds and as it goes on as it goes on you'll get more you'll get the likelihood of rain forming rain droplets much bigger than cloud droplets but it's still a similar process going as they just increase in size all the way up to rain droplets and then fall out of the sky. Generally speaking then the, the region of the atmosphere that's influenced by the Earth's surface is called a boundary layer and that will generally extend to say a kilometre above ground level. That's where the atmosphere is responding to what's happening on the ground, if you like. But uh, in the case of um, mountains, they can affect the, the, the atmosphere in different ways because of the, they can, in effect, create a wave-like response in the atmosphere, which can go often many kilometres higher than that. What sort of evidence is there for, the, for these, this, this sort of influence of the atmosphere? Visually, as a, as a casual observer, you can see it by the presence of uh, lenticular clouds that look almost like UFOs. It's a very active area of research in meteorology, understanding how mountains influence the weather. There are, there are, there are a, a vast community of meteorologists around the world that are trying to understand this, and it, it's, I'd be lying if I said it's well understood. Yeah, okay, so what you're saying is upwind of other hills or mountain chain there'll be more rainfall than there is downwind and so obviously if um, winds are blowing into a mountain chain or hills then the, the topography the landscape will force the air to go up and this will cause the air to cool and the water vapor in the air to condense and to form clouds and um, rainfall and then when the air goes over to the other side of the mountains or hills then the moist, most of the, much of the moisture has already been rained out of the air and therefore the air is drier and there will be less cloud on precipitation. Generally, with, you know, if the winds, the, we have a prevailing wind in the, in the northern hemisphere which comes from the west. So if, if, if the flow is coming from, from the west and you put mountains in front of it, it's going to hit into the mountain, well I said mountain, the Pennines. And they'll want to, they, they need to go somewhere because they can't just, they, when they hit it, they're going to have to go either up or around, and it depends on the shape of the mountains. And the, the wind comes in, it hits the, hits, the, hits the Pennines, and then if it goes up and it's more likely to rain there, it's less likely to rain on the other side because you've taken the water out of the atmosphere. And uh, so that's why we're getting rain on the, on the uh, Manchester side of the Pennines. In my chase for Sheffield's rain shadow, I encountered David Schultz, a professor of meteorology from Manchester University who had a different idea about the phenomena. With some help from his colleague, 
He proposed we collaborate on some research to test the existence of the rain shadow. What you'd expect when westerly winds flow is an enhancement of rainfall over Manchester and the peaks and a reduction in rain over Sheffield. So with the rain and wind records from the last 30 years, I set to work with the aim of measuring the regional differences to quantify the influence of the peaks on the weather and to find out how often it happens. Under westerly flow, I boarded a train to Manchester. The transition in weather seemed indicative. Clouds get installed by the peaks. Through showers in the city, I headed for the university to meet with David and his researcher, Jonathan, to present my findings with the hope that their knowledge could unravel the myth. Hi. Hello. Hey, good to see you, Alex. Nice to see you Welcome again. back. Remember good Jonathan? Yeah. Good to see you. So, Alex, tell us what you brought with you. Um, so, this is the data I've got so far. Um, I found that on westerly days, when the winds blow from west to east, that in Manchester, 74% of the time it rains, whereas in Sheffield, only 58% of the time it rains. And this equates to 32 fewer days per year that it rains in Sheffield than in Manchester. So from what I'm seeing then, it looks like we can explain the difference in precipitation, easterly, westerly, part of the time, but it doesn't fully explain the difference in precipitation uh, occurrence between Manchester and Sheffield. From here, we turn to the visual reconstructions of the rainfall which Jonathan had created. This oh, case is there. interesting because obviously westerly flow out ahead of the line. Look, this appears to be, you know, yeah, the, well, the peak associated with a, with a rain shadow, you know, because, yeah, the, the echoes are, you know, until that line comes through. Yeah. <coughs> I think that's what happens in a lot of cases, like, it'll hold it up for a bit, mm. and then, then the wind direction will change, and mm. this, the weather pattern coming through will just yeah. force it over. We then looked at the average distribution of rainfall across the entire country, try and figure out what's really going on. You see, you know, the Pennines running, you know, north-south here in central England and uh, very clearly related to a strong gradient in precipitation west to east. So it makes sense that someone may look at this and say, oh yeah, this is very clearly a rain shadow because there's such a strong difference between the amount of precipitation on the west side and much less precipitation on the east side. So the, the landscape is definitely having some influence on the rainfall pattern. Oh, absolutely, no doubt about it. But I think there's only so far that you can push the rain shadow um, hypothesis to explain the distribution of precipitation in England. What other explanations could account for the, for the difference between the east and the west and the rainfall? So I think if you were to sum up, you know, all the different factors that affect Precipitation, yeah, certainly the terrain here is affecting precipitation on a very local scale. Um, but I think put in the context of the large-scale flow, these systems are weakening, they're moving off to the northeast. And I think also this effect that, you know, sometimes you see fronts that are oriented from northeast to southwest. They drape down here and they may dissipate, run out of precipitation before they get down to the southeast. I can't prove any of this, and I think that's why, you know, when you approached us about, you know, studying the rain shadow, I think it was a perfect opportunity to explore some of these questions. And I'm sure, you know, that the work that you've done won't be the end-all answer to this. There's more to be done. So we're now at the end of our journey. After chasing the rain shadow across Sheffield and Manchester, we found that the idea was first created in 1956 by a professor of geography at the University of Sheffield. We explored the evidence for the existence of the rain shadow through looking at rainfall maps, radar footage, the influence of the landscape on the development of clouds. By talking to scientists in Sheffield, Manchester and Leeds, we unravelled the processes behind how the rain shadow works, how it's a combination of interactions between the land and the atmosphere, how it could be due to the uplifting of air and the formation of clouds and rainfall above the peaks, how it could be due to the diversion of flow around the peaks, or as the scientists in Manchester proposed, the Peak District could have a lesser influence than we think. So to answer the question, when will it happen next? Well it's definitely going to happen under westerly flow, as the air comes in from Manchester and the peaks. 
it's most likely to happen under stable conditions with low wind speeds and a moist atmosphere. But the atmosphere and the weather are complex things. Who knows what's going to happen next?